Hello again. We are back and live from Amsterdam, Melkweg. Welcome to our second panel discussion. Our next panel bears the title Image Making and In and Outside the Institutions. In this conversation, we are interested to hear the experience of our speakers coming from multidisciplinary practices. Which kind of new forms of showcasing are institutions and alternative platforms presenting? And how successfully the culture industry is adapting alongside multidisciplinary artists and how they represent them? The panel discussion will be moderated by Delphine Bedel, an artist, writer, curator, publisher and director of feminist platform Metabooks, which is dedicated to emerging practices in photography design and experimental publishing. Delphine works with leading cultural institutions, museums, photography festivals and art and design academies. She's a member of the German Photography Academy and as a long-time adv advocate of a more inclusive environment in the art and design field, Bedel is co-founder of Engagement Arts Netherlands and the Roadmap for Equality in the Arts in the Netherlands. Delphine, welcome and please present your speakers. Yes. Hello, Marina. Thank you very much for the invitation and to have uh, all of us uh, here today. And thank you also, Futures, for putting this event together. So I'm uh, very, very happy to have um, amazing uh, guests today with us, um, Clarisse Gagar here. Um, who is a journalist, writer, filmmaker. Um, I will um, also uh, speak more extensively. She's a founder, co-founder of Lilith Magazine and Lilith Agency that she will also present uh, today. Uh, she has worked uh, for Dutch media organization, BNN, Vara, ATC5, NSA Vogue, and The Correspondent, among others. She represented the Netherlands in the United Nations organization, UN Women, in 2019. Uh, she's an advocate of political and social themes such as emancipation and equality. Gaga sits on the supervisory board of the Holland Festival. She's also a board member of Gaga Incorporated, an agrarian enterprise in Liberia run by a brother. Um, so... Um, Gaga, her parents are originally from Liberia. She was born in the United States and has lived in the Netherlands since age four. The documentary Daddy and the Warlord about a father and the Liberian civil war, which she made in collaboration with Shamira Rafaela, won the Golden Call for Best Short Documentary in 2019. Uh, she then published a book that elaborates on the film Subjects Matter, which I have here. So, uh, and um, Rhein also uh, is a curator. I think I will present maybe uh, the biography with each speaker. They will first uh, all uh, make a short presentation, but we have Rhein Desley, who is curator at FOMU in the Photography Museum in Antwerp. And online on Zoom, we have with us uh, Polumi Basu, who is a transmedia uh, artist and activist, and uh, Valentin Umansky, who is a uh, curator international art at, at the Tate. So, hello. I don't know if we can see both of them. Um. <laughs> So, um, and hello to everybody who is online or in the room or good uh, afternoon, good morning, good evening. I don't know what time you're watching this. Uh, you can put in the stream also where you're from if you feel like. Um, and uh, so the structure of the talk is simple. We will have a short presentation by each speaker and we, we, which will be followed by a conversation and we will have a 15 minute Q&A at the end. Um, so that's it. So I, um, um, the order of the speaker will be, uh, we will first have Pulumi and then um, Clarice, uh, then Valentin and then Raina. So, um, so I have to... Hi. Hi, Pulumi. Can you hear me? Hi, Pulumi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear Great. us? Great, so, uh, yes, yes, um, I can hear. I can just watch myself at the screen, which is very strange. <laughs> but hello, everyone. I'm an Indian 
transmedia artist and activist working in multidisciplinary platforms. I'm from India. I'm born and brought up in Calcutta in India, but I live uh, between London and Calcutta. So currently I'm in um, just in the suburbs of London where I live. Um, my work kind of um, sort of represents uh, contentious, complex realities. I both I use both facts and fiction to um, present multi-layered narratives and um, in in storytelling. I work across uh, photography, photo books, uh, film, uh, animation, and virtual reality. Um, I'm particularly in, interested in sort of. Um, uh, as a post-colonial artist, my interest has always been in um, uh, so, uh, doing the full circle of sort of involving uh, uh, treating art as a social practice, but also beyond just representing your work in galleries inside institutions and galleries and spaces, but also taking it back to the community and seeing real ground change and see how art can impact change. Um, with reference to that, I just uh, wanted to particularly speak about one body of work called Blood Speaks um, I, that I've been working on since 2013, which uh, really essentially deals with um, blood politics and how uh, sort of women's lives are curtailed and um, uh, um, um, and how women face different kinds of abuse the minute they hit puberty, the minute a woman in South Asia is uh, moving from a, pu uh, a girl to a womanhood and her menstruation begins, how it, all her challenges in her life starts. In particular, I documented and worked and trekked with women in Nepal and India where they're sent into exile uh, during the time they bleed for the rest of their life. They, are, they get uh, raped, abused, and murdered while they're in exile. Uh, the work uh, is a big photography piece, um, but it's also, um, I did two campaigns. Uh, this is the website, all of the information, if you can scroll through the website, everything is there. I did two for, um, I, didn't, I not only uh, documented and worked uh, with the women on the field, but I also did major, two major campaigns, one of which was called uh, To Be a Girl, where together with Water Aid, we raised two million pounds to provide reusable sanitary kits and build toilets for women in India and Nepal. Uh, I did another campaign called um, with Action Aid on World Menstruation Day, and we did a similar fundraising in 2018 as well. So uh, with all of, and eventually I decided that it was just becoming a problem, misogyny and this sort of domestic abuse and uh, this sort of uh, normalized violence against women. I was being categorized as someone with problems from the majority world and how, you know, people in the West don't have that, but I disagreed and I felt like misogyny is hidden in plain sight in every culture. And I decided to make something more, uh, uh, can we go back to the blood speak site, please? And I decided to, um, yeah, make something slightly more sensorial, uh, which kind of collapses the gap between, say, a white cube audience and spectators of someone and someone living in Nepal. So I decided to bring in virtual reality, which is a very um, uh, immersive, probably the most immersive medium to show uh, your work, uh, show uh, any form of art, because... Um, in VR, because of its pitfalls, like because it's not a collective experience, it's an individualist experience, it's extremely present um, and it's an isolating tech. All of its pitfalls became the strength, which kind of mirrored the exile that women were facing as well. So I decided to use VR to enhance the sensorial experiences of the audiences from a white first world country to understand and really viscerally feel what women are going through. There's a trailer just uh, beyond the amplifying voices. Maybe we can play that. Um, if you just scroll down. Yeah. The blood speaks. Yeah, that's the trailer. Maybe we can just play that. It's only a few minutes. Can we play it full screen? Yeah. Yeah. Full screen. The sound is missing. I don't know if you can hear sound. 
No, we cannot hear the sound. Oh, there is sound there. So that's the, just a small little trailer, but obviously it's very uh, immersive. It's just a head capture from the headset, what you've just seen. Um, the, the way I installed the work was I had a two-room installation where the photographs were lit with uh, in a dark uh, room with, la with uh, light boxes. And um, the second room had projections and also the VR in the middle where you could dive into three different women and experience the exile with those three women and the reason I decided to also do it because with virtual reality live action especially you just put the camera down and you leave and and you let the let the sitter take full authority of how much of of the story they really want to tell so in a way the women are presenting themselves with agency and reclaiming the narrative and coming up and stepping up as sort of um survivors of this violence and telling you their story. So it's, I felt it's quite a powerful and uh, um, an equal way of showing the work where women are powerful and have sort of an immutable agency while telling their own stories of violence and stepping up as um, survivors. So uh, yeah, so my practice sort of, uh, I mean, this has been published everywhere around the world from Time Magazine, New York Times to uh, National Geographic. And in 2018, we took it to Nepal and we showed it there in a big uh, Kathmandu Film Festival. And it created, we uh, took it to the social policy makers with uh, activists at ground level and together we created a new uh, we passed a new law that criminalizes the practice of menstrual exile and now arrests have started happening since 2018 where if you're caught sending a woman into exile you go into prison so which is great for the work because uh, the commitment with which we all worked since 2013 till like 18 saw some ground level impact and currently I'm now uh, so the work was uh, went to a lot of film festivals, but it was also shown in American Natural History Museum, New York, um, and different festivals. And um, uh, I've never had full space to show the whole of the transmedia activism work in its full breadth, length, and breadth. But uh, next year, I have the book, the photo book coming out, and a graphic novel, and I'm working on a. Uh, VR quill animation piece um, that's completely fiction. So yeah, that's um, 
but I guess I've spoken 10 minutes and spoken a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bulomi. <laughs> We will come back to, to the in-depth uh, on this project that is so uh, multi-layered. Um, we will continue the short introduction um, with uh, Clarisse. Uh, so um, I think she's asked to show a platform, Lilith Magazine. Yeah. So the microphone is yours. Thank you. And also, Bulumi, thank you so much. I uh, can't wait to hear more about uh, uh, your practice. Um, I don't have a presentation, <laughs> so for everyone that was maybe expecting uh, that, I'm just going to talk about what it is that I do and why I do it. And I think that uh, what I do also uh, always changes, uh, which is of course why we talk about hybrid uh, practices. So um, Delphine introduced me already. I'm a journalist, writer, filmmaker. Um, some would say I'm an activist, although I do not uh, identify as one. I think activism is a part, a large part of what I do. Um, in my work, um, I use different uh, uh, media genres to uh, address, um, um, yeah, I talk about uh, resistance, emancipation, social injustice, and um, yeah, lately I, I also like to redefine it and I think it, a lot of the work that I do is about creation and not necessarily creation in the sense that I'm creating this um, this this uh, art or this product which is maybe the the end result but um, creating um, helping to create a different world basically to imagine to envision and to create it within the small space and influence um, that I have that for me is what is at the core of what I do, and I think it expresses itself in uh, in, in various ways. Um, so one of the things that I've uh, done, I've worked within um, yeah media institutions, uh, um, um, yeah very known media institutions, and um, and and also decided at a certain point that um, to do things differently, um, you also have to create outside of the system. Um, so then we started uh, Lilith Magazine, which is um, a feminist journalistic platform here in the Netherlands. And uh, Lilith Mag Magazine, it's, um, yeah, it's about intersectional uh, feminism. Does everyone, who doesn't know what intersectional feminism is? Put your hands up. Oh, almost everyone, oh, okay. <laughs> that doesn't happen a lot. Um, but for those that don't know, it's a, a feminism that um, addresses various um, yeah, that, that centers at the axis of various uh, um, social injustices. So also acknowledging that um, all our liberation is tied together, whether you're a woman, you know, person of color, LGBT person, that there are multiple systems of oppressions and that sometimes they, or often actually, they cross over. Um, whether you're, you know, working class or, um, 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 yeah, like I said, a LGBT person, a person with disabilities, there are all, all of, the, of these oppressive systems in place. And um, yeah, we need to sort of um, realize that they are all tied together and find ways in which we can address them and tackle them together as well. And um, so we started this. I started this alongside uh, Hesnel Maroudi, um, my um, uh, partner and friend. Um, because we've been working in media for like um, over a decade and we miss sort of particular uh, uh, women's voices and then uh, and, and voices of marginalized people. And not in the sense that you're like, oh, we're going to put this person on the cover and then check this box because they, they you know, have this and this identity, but it's about, you know, participation, about um, um, perspective. And I think when you only show one particular perspective of society, you're doing an injustice to, you know, to um, multiple groups of people, but also to society as a whole, because then you're not being, trying to be truthful or um, sh sh to show that there are complicated and complex narratives. I think that is also a theme in my work, that there is no black and white, everything is always sort of, um, yeah, complex, and, and that, that is what life is. Um, so, um, yeah, so we have uh, women and people from marginalized backgrounds write about uh, 
yeah, their expertise, that can be politics, art and culture, um, um, science, um, you name it. And uh, I think often there's this sort of um, misconception that w w when you're um, feminist or uh, when you have a certain expertise that it doesn't go together with um, fashion or, or art or maybe just these very, what people seem to think are frivolous topics. But um, I think what you're seeing worldwide, for example, like in the United States with uh, Teen Vogue or, you know, you have these sort of intersectional feminist uh, magazines and platforms happening worldwide, also in Europe, that um, that we're also not accepting that narrative that when, when you're uh, political, you can't also um, look nice, you know? Um, <laughs> which is strange because why not? Or that when you're a feminist, you know, you can't also, I pole dance, for example. Um, um, so yeah, so this is what we do and we provide a platform and also we try to uh, provide a space for those that um, maybe would want to become uh, writers or journalists or work with the media to develop themselves, to also share the knowledge that we have gained in the past, you know, decades uh, plus. Um, and so that they can go on and work within these institutions or maybe start their own institutions so that you can have this plural form, you know, this plural media instead of just this, yeah, this very, um, yeah, segregated and, and one dimensional um, um, source of information. Um, so yeah, we do different things. We do talks, we do um, uh, podcasts, uh, we do events. Uh, we also work together with a lot of the media that we ourselves work for, the institutions, because I think, yeah, it's also, it should be a collaboration. Um, what else do we do? Uh, um, we created a sort of feminist code recently, which you can see here, feminist city and economy. What does it mean when we talk about, you know, we often talk about things that we don't want, but what do we want? What does a feminist city look like? What does a feminist economy look like? And I think it also brings a lot of joy to these things because then you get to imagine. And this is one of the, it's a, I love this illustration um, made by uh, uh, Sofia Neto. Um, you know, it's like a dreamscape of a feminist city. And, um, and there's like, uh, yeah, you have same-sex couples, there's a lot of nature, you have um, um, people with different religious backgrounds, um, um, there is no climate crisis there. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, especially now going through all, all of these um, sort of, um, yeah, there's so much conflict, the pandemic, and, and, and that it's really important to not only think about um, what we don't want, but how do we create what we want? Do we even know what it is that we want and that we should discuss that more and talk about it. Um, so that's, um, that's what I try to do. And, and uh, personally, um, uh, I also, uh, yeah, I've written a book and I have a documentary. Maybe we can look at the trailer. I don't know if it's possible to go to my website, um, clarissegargards.nl. Um, is that possible to go to my website so we can watch the trailer of the documentary? So not Lilith Mag, this is the magazine. Uh, ClariseGargard.nl, so just, just my name. Um, yeah, uh, uh, with uh, my director, Shamira Rafaela, I also made a documentary about my um, um, family history and background. Um, uh, my father, who worked for the Liberian government, Liberia is in West Africa, for those that don't know. Um, and um, yeah, he was an, uh, an, uh, an, an engineer and he um, worked together with uh, different uh, um, leaders and also Charles Taylor, who was a, a dictator and who has been imprisoned in um, the, the UK, but he was, he, he was trialed here in, um, uh, in Den Haag. And um, yeah, I sort of tried to research my, my own background. I was wondering because I was brought up with all of these ideals and I was like, okay, so what happens when you work for you know, someone like that. So I went back to Liberia to sort of talk to my father and research that. And um, in the book, I also expand on that. And uh, I talk about um, where colonialism comes in and imperialism because Liberia was founded by um, um, freed enslaved people. 
um, who sort of had the idea that they were going back to Africa, but they were actually not really African anymore. And then they did the same thing to the sort of um, indigenous communities that was done to them. They enslaved them as well. And that was sort of the history of the country. So a lot of the conflicts came from that history. And um, yeah, so it was, um, for me, it was um, a way to sort of use um, my personal story to talk about all of these different things in a, in a complex way, the complex, these complex narratives, because I think often, particularly when you talk, when, you know, we speak of the global south or, you know, Africa, um, it's always very one dimensional and um, that just doesn't do justice to, uh, yeah, to these complex narratives. Um, yeah, the trailer is down there. If you go down, I think you get to see, yeah, that's, no, up, that's Lilith. <laughs> if you go a little bit up again, yeah, it's already playing. I don't know if you can click on it or hear the sound. If you scroll down, do you see the trailer? Yeah. Ready? You ready? Tell us how of drop up child soldiers are raping and killing our citizens. Were you friends with Charles Sailor? Yes, I was friendly with all of them. looking for the court documents, I couldn't find them. Things disappear around here. Papers and people. He trusts me to do the right thing for him. You can never tell what war does to a human being. It brings out the beast in me. It's not the angel that somebody is trying to take him. Maybe he did terrible things. Maybe. You'll never find him unless you search for them. Go search. So you can know who your father actually is. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that was the trailer. Um, like I said, so um, I sort of the couple of years um, tried to research these complex narratives or of what is right and wrong and the context of a war like Liberia and um, uh, which was a difficult process. But I think, you know, when we talk about sort of um, creating change in society, we also have to try to create change within ourselves and question ourselves and yeah, the people around us. Um, and that can also be done in a very loving way. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's, that's it. <laughs> and do you want to say a few words or show the book also? For yeah, so yeah. this is the book. Um, um, it hasn't been translated yet. It's, I don't know where. Yeah. Drakendochter, uh, Daughter of Dragons. And it, um, um, the title, my, my um, grandfather was um, one of the last rural kings of a certain area in Liberia. And um, rumor has it, or legend has it, that he was uh, this fierce warrior who used to fly on the back of a dragon and sort of lay siege to other villages. So um, it's, a, it's a story about survival, things you have to do to survive, particularly with in, in a country um, like Liberia. And that, you know, he passed that on to his son, who sort of uh, passed it on to me in a different context, and that I'm sort of the, the daughter of dragons, but also breaking the circle of just surviving, but also thinking about what does it mean to, to live and to thrive. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Clarice, for this presentation. <laughs> and we're also going to come back <laughs> to see this. Um, the next uh, short presentation we will have will be by uh, Valentin Umansky, who is with us on Zoom online from London. Uh, she's a curator, author, and critic, and she has worked with various institutions dedicated to visual arts and currently is acting as curator international art at 10 Modern. Between 2015 and 20, she really collected 
to the US, where she held position at the International Center for Photography, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati. In France, between 2010 and 15, she collaborated with Rencontre d'Al Festival and published Duane Michel's Storyteller, uh, with Filigran. She has written for a wide range of art magazines, including Aperture and Form. A most recent exhibition includes two solo presentations of the work of Pamela Fatismo Sundstrom and Saya Wolflack. Uh, and uh, the group exhibition Confinement Politics of Space and Bodies. In 2010, she also co-curated the Lagos Photo Festival, which led to a large survey of modern, um, uh, of modern and contemporary Nigerian art layers organized uh, with Hie Yani Owengbusha and exhibited in France 2019 and 20. Valentin, the word is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Um, the first thing I just wanted to note is that it's really nice to be speaking only with women. Um, I guess that's already a new reality that maybe some institutions have not really grappled with, that we can um, talk together without the presence of men and things go, things go well. Um, so thank you uh, to Marina and Delphine for that, for making that happen. Uh, although that's not the topic of today. Um, maybe if we can pull the images. Um, I don't know if you can see them well. Um, so the, the first image um, I think is, a, is the one I wanted to start with um, to give a bit of a context um, as to what I do really at Tate Modern and generally what I'm interested in and I think is important in this moment. Um, Delphine gave a pretty clear overview of some of the things I've done, but I guess if I summarize it, I've always been interested in like questions of visibility, uh, whether that's film and video or uh, photography, um, although I've worked with different other mediums. Uh, and this image is actually a press image um, by Kin Cheng uh, of the dem demonstration in Hong Kong in 2020 last year, is where you see like, um, pro-democracy um, protesters just holding their cameras um, and kind of like uniting their flashes using the digital technology um, as a, a tool for political unity. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm starting with this just to say that this question of um, how images are used and how technology is used has always been kind of like at the center of things I'm interested in. So the next uh, three slides, uh, if we can go over them quickly, that's um, to contextualize a bit the, the work I do at Tate. So the one just before shows you, I hope the quality is decent. Um, so this and the one after show you a bit like the context in which I'm now working, which is um, in charge of uh, moving images, film and video basically, but sound as well um, at Tate. Um, and just to give you an idea, like the first videos that were acquired um, date back only to the 70s, like the first one acquired was Gilbert and George in 72. Um, but in the span of, I guess, 50 years, the technology has changed drastically. And I'm really interested in like what the present situation calls for. Um, this question of hybridity and also how we can think about showing um, and making film and video in this moment. Um, the next slide is kind of like a larger project that Tate has like embarked on, two actually. One is the Media and Transition Conference and the other one is a very recent uh, project called Reshaping the Collectible. All that is because like the transformation of the technology imply us rethinking what it means to conserve um, video and, and film. And in a sense, it starts to question how technology evolves and maybe even our understanding of it evolves. I don't need to tell you all that over the last year with the pandemic, we all became very used to this like weird Zoom environment. A lot more people listen to podcasts. People even from different generations, older generations became more accustomed to like computers. So there's been a massive shift. So um, if we look at the next slide, 
um, that's the project I'm working on at the moment, um, temporarily titled Deep Time. Um, but really what this is, is an, a question I'm posing, which is, can we present works, film and video, in the way we used to in the past? It's sort of a upload and 2.0 upload and remix of some of Tate's um, time-based media collection works. Um, and the idea is that really with the development of like technology, but also our way of grappling with it, we can show the works the way uh, we used to, even the works we have in the collection. Um, so I'm proposing that we really like rethink um, the way we show work. The image that you have here with the blue projection and actually the one right after are just two examples of works that we have in Tate's collection. And I wonder really what we could make of them and how to show them in the 21st century and in 2021. This one specifically is a piece by Grada Quilomba, um, an artist um, from Portugal and also a psychologist um, who has been working quite extensively with like trauma. Um, and it's especially the question of um, um, Portugal imperialism uh, on various um, African countries and contexts. Um, and we acquire this piece that operates in kind of this um, dual nature with one screen, uh, the one you see on the left, which is Grada herself being the narrator of a story. And then on the right, you have this projection with two other characters that you see interacting. And what I'm proposing for this exhibition called Deep Time is to work with a few artists to kind of like propose reinterpretations of their works together and develop them uh, in an expanded way, which could be VR. So that ties maybe with what Pulomi was sharing of her process, um, because I do think that it's important, especially for some of the, the early works that we've acquired at Tate, to really think if um, artists would um, show the work that way or create the work that way today, um, not recreating works, because that's obviously not what we want to do, but thinking whether in collaboration with artists, there are some expansions that uh, would be interesting to them in this moment. Um, I guess part of the thinking behind this, if we go to the next slide, is also um, deciding how we highlight um, projects, how we show them and what comes into uh, visibility. As a curator, I kind of have to question that all the time because there are politics of violence in the way we show and represent. Um, so the next slide is basically a bla black slide. Um, and I don't know if you can even see the names because the, uh, my face is probably on it. Um, but sometimes I just um, wonder if it's not more powerful and more meaningful to kind of like not show things. This, this is uh, um, this idea that things come in and out of sight, and I'm quite interested in, in that, that, that concept. Um, and I think for me, if you reflect on images and representation with uh, photography, film and video, there comes a moment when sometimes like the idea of um, choosing not to show uh, becomes central. Um, maybe the last couple of images um, we can go over quickly, especially the next one. Um, and I don't know if you can see it full screen, it seems like it's cutting a bit of the edges, but that's an image from the Rencontre d'Arles, and that's uh, the first show I worked on was while I was a staff at the Rencontre d'Arles, um, and it was related to this project called From Year On, um, that I think in my past as a curator of photography already kind of expressed where I was thinking, um, which is um, the presence of images and kind of the numerous images that we're surrounded by, um, they don't really make sense if they're, if you just look at all of them. So we have to kind of like one, really think about what this number of images kind of means and two, kind of like be very selective um, in what we show. Um, and sometimes that goes back to this question of we're all taking images, obviously, but um, as a curator, I think the role is a bit um, different and I, I really question where uh, we come in. I don't know if we can jump to the last slide. 
the one after, yeah, and show the whole slide. I don't know if it's cut as well. Um, but that's maybe the last project I wanted to mention. Aside from my work at Tate, um, I also act as the artistic director of this prize. I tend to hate the concept of prizes, which is why I created this proposal, which is a, in a sense, a prize that tries to um, disengage from the way um, the market has um, promoted specific artists and questions also um, the imposition of narratives that can, um, that can happen when uh, a random artist is uh, chosen by a random group of people and sent to uh, work and photograph and represent uh, in a specific context. So kind of like trying to uh, reverse this process, I proposed a different kind of prize that is um, very slow in its pace to actually allow for deep time and deep reflection. Um, it is awarded every two years. And uh, it allows an artist that already has a project on a specific um, area or context to develop it, um, being supported and chosen by people from that context. Um, and so this is the current, um, the current open call, uh, the, the geographical area for this, this um, upcoming ex edition is the Rhone River between Switzerland and France. Um, but I just wanted to highlight this because I think, again, in the work we do um, that as curators, we have uh, an opportunity to really sort of uh, rethink the way things have been historically um, crafted and uh, told, how stories have been told. And I think um, it's a bit tricky um, to see processes replicate themselves. So I'm just trying to often sort of bypass um, the regular um, and the traditional processes, I guess. And that's a bit where I see our role. Thank you, Valentin. <laughs> We will also come back, and I'm also curious about the work you did in Cincinnati. Um, so we go to our uh, next uh, guest, who here is in person, Rain Desley. Uh, so she has been working as a curator at uh, FOMI, Photo Museum in Antwerp, since 2010. She has curated ser several thematical exhibitions, including Claude Samuel Zanele, Show Us the Money, Shooting Range, and you seen nothing yet and rebel lives and solo shows for Mathieu Asselin, Saul Leiter, Camille Picot, Harry Gaivart, Sébastien Rosé, Stéphane van Flenteren and Jan Hoek among uh, many others. She's the founder of the platform of emerging uh, Belgian talent TIF uh, since 2012 and helped establish Trigger, an online and printed magazine. She's frequently asked as a jury member for international photography masters, grants and awards. Welcome, Rein. The word is yours. Thank you. That's a, <laughs> a very thorough uh, introduction. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, yeah, well, actually, it's, it's, it's funny because I'm used to talk about other people's work, so it's it's uh, it's nice to to talk about my own work for. Yeah. I'm just gonna put my microphone yeah. to you. Yeah. Better. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically, I wanted to to start by elaborating a little bit about the exhibitions that I did. So I've been uh, working as a curator um, at the Photo Museum in Antwerp since 2010. Um, it's it's an institutional job, so it, it's it's comes along with um, making exhibitions like on a very regular basis, which is um, poses a, a very different um, way of working, I suppose, than people who work as a freelance curator um, do different things. Um, so yeah, let me just walk you through a few of them, of the exhibitions that I made. Um, in the museum, we well for the last ten years at least, we've we've basically always looked at uh, one year as as a total, where we wanted to to give uh, the public different um, yeah entrance 
towards photography. Um, we do this by thematical shows, by big uh, retrospective shows, by highlighting young Belgian artists. Um, and, but also, uh, we find it very important to show some internationally cutting-edge projects. So we try to balance all these aspects in, in our program, um, which gives us the opportunity, of course, to, to reach a large audience, but also to introduce them to different projects that they might never have seen. Um, so yeah, uh, starting with the thematical shows, this is uh, some images from a show that I did in 2015. 15, I think, shows the money. It was uh, going uh, about tax havens and the financial world and, and all the atrocities that, that come about with um, with these um, <clears throat> with this team. Um, I made an exhibition on music and photography a long time ago. I made a thematical exhibition on the First World War and the impact of photography in the war. Um, I made a, recently an exhibition with. Uh, Claude Cahaz, Samuel Zanele, uh, sorry, Samuel Fosso and Zanele Moholi around the self-portraits, which was a really interesting project. Um, I did some solo shows, big retrospectives from, for Belgian artist Harry Greijaert, um, Soul Lighter, it was, um, was very unknown in Belgium at that time and, and it was a great um, crowd success at that time. I made an exhibition of, with August Sander, so also very classical um, uh, pho uh, photographers. And then, yeah, when, when the favorite part of my job, in a way, <laughs> I think that's the, the young Belgian artist that I'm working with. So uh, I did uh, a solo show with Camille Pico, Jan Rossel, Sébastien Rosé, for example. But as you mentioned, of course, the, the TIFF exhibitions and, and the whole program is something that's very close to my heart. It's also the reason why I'm here in this future program. Um, so we started it in 2012. It was at the beginning a magazine. Um, but then it's, it always grew towards something that, yeah, now I like to look at it at a as a traje tra trajectory of, um, of development, of we, us, as a museum, as a big, heavy institution, using uh, our power to connect people with the people that we know. Um, I like to think of it as, as yeah, giving the photographers the opportunity to use us um, instead of the other way around. And I know that we always use photographers. We, we yeah, that's, that's how we do it in a way. It's, he, it's impossible to escape, but I want to uh, challenge photographers also to teach us how not to use them and how they can use us instead. So that's, that's really the, the heart of, of this TIFF idea, um, which is constantly evolving. So also now with this futures platform, it becomes European. So that's a, a next step. And let's see where it ends up. I'm um, really curious. Um, yeah, and then I also want to mention these international cutting edge projects. We did Hana Darabi, for example. I had um, a show with Mathieu Asselin. Uh, we had a, um, a festival called Braakland a couple of years ago, which was really us opening up the exhibition space for local projects, for very um, also international, but, but things that, that normally don't make it into the, the, the heavy, um, yeah, every criteria that we have for, for programming for the big shows, but to have a very short and, and quick energy um, in the exhibition halls. It was a very difficult project because it's, I mean, it poses so many um, challenges and so many expectations from, from the, the participants, but it's super learnful and nice to be able to do that in, in a museum also. I might, I'm forgetting about the presentation, yeah. so I'll, <laughs> I'll just flip through some images. Mm -hmm. I, I post these images because I, I just wanted to give you an idea for the people who don't know the museum. We have uh, four exhibition spaces going from 500 square meters to 150. So it's a lot of space to fill. Um, but on the other hand, we have like nine exhibitions per year. So that's it's also not so much uh, you can do. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to talk very briefly about how we choose these the, the exhibitions we program. Um, we have five criteria actually that we that we um, made explicit. Um, so they're not in in any order. So so it's it's really. Uh, 
So you have contemporary relevance. They, every project has to be relevant today for an audience, because of course, in the first place, we do our work for our audience. Um, the ethical framework the work is made in, so we really try not to show any work um, that is against the ethical framework that we um, are making explicit. This is something that changes, of course. It's something that, um, that evolves all the time, and, and that's also, I think, inherent in, in this aspect. Um, diversity, going from representation, but also all the um, different aspects that photography can be. So we are a photography museum, not, not necessarily an art museum, so that's a very specific constitution, and it's something that we want to embrace in all its, all its forms also. So uh, then you have the geographical context, so we want to, to relate to local artists, but also um, place them in a, in a high-quality international context. Um, and then the last one is the audience, of course. Um, so we want to, to make work for our audience because they are um, our main uh, goal, of course. Um, two other, yeah, something else that I wanted to highlight is Trigger that you all already mentioned uh, is a magazine and an online platform that we developed. Um, so we've been doing that for three, it's the third year now. Um, it comes from a long tradition of, of extra magazine that we used to do. It's, it's basically in Belgium, um, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think it's the only one, uh, the only magazine who really makes time for in-depth um, text about photography. So it's, it's photography in context um, that we want to highlight. We always work with a different partner. So every year we have a different partner that we uh, work with. See if I have. Oh, here is trigger. Uh, so the first issue was on impact. It was with the KBK in Den Haag. Uh, the next one was uh, about. Un it was titled "Uncertainty." It was uh, developed with the School of Speculative Documentary in, in Ghent. Um, and the next one is coming up in November. So we're going to launch it in, in uh, at Paris Photo. Um, so that's a, a very yeah, big work also, because it's, it's quite a heavy, text-heavy book that we're producing, um, but a really important work, I think. Then TIFF, I already elaborated a little bit. And then a new thing that we installed in, during the, the COVID crisis, actually, is that we kind of spontaneously, um, we felt that we needed to do something for, for our local artists um, during this uh, crisis time, so we developed um, as a kind of grant, giving, inviting five artists uh, to work on, on new work. Um, this was developed very quickly, like in a week we had to come up with, with an idea to give an answer to, to this crisis. Um, but I think we did it well in the sense that we didn't uh, fix everything right away. We just invited people and then going along, uh, we noticed where the errors were in, in, in our approach, so we adapted them. Um, so I think that's, that's basically the, the big lesson that I've learned, is that everything that you throw out into the world, you can still adapt it if you see it's wrong. That's something you just have to do. Um, be vulnerable as an institution in order to learn from your mistakes and, um, and do better, <laughs> thinking about the future. And uh, this is something that right now we're working very hard on to, to develop further. So, so this whole idea of supporting local talent, um, also not only emerging artists, but also this what comes next, uh, with the, this next level idea of artists that, that we want to give them a, yeah, a support and, and also feedback and, and working uh, thoroughly with them, not just superficially and, and only giving them exposure, but really listening, trying to listen to what they need and what we can do for them again. Yeah, I think that's... <laughs> I, do you want to mention something about the collection also, a new current work on the collection? Um, so we have a very large collection. Um, the museum is structured in a way that we have like um, uh, two curators working on the temporary exhibitions and then we have curators working on the collection exhibitions, so I'm one of the first. Um, but we, this is something for the future also that we really want to work together more closely. I think it's super important. I think this, um, <clears throat> the criteria that I mentioned for the temporary exhibitions are very important for the collection work also. So how we want to show this 
collection is something that we really have to do together and inviting people um, to help us um, deal with this heritage that we that we have um, it's it's not an easy task and we need input from experts audience um, because we cannot do that alone it's it's not ours to um, to decide on 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 how we will present this this is this is something that's from everybody and and it's a very sometimes a very problematic thing um, sometimes a very beautiful thing I mean it's not only negative but but we have to rethink the way that we show um, everything basically <laughs> so, yeah thank you thank for you presentation yes so um, now we have uh, had all the presentations as you can see we're gonna it's already covering a, a broad scope of topics uh, ranging from women's rights, marginalized community, truths and wars, new format of publishing, presenting, preserving, and uh, impact and the need of complex stories. Um, as uh, Chimananda, um, as she says, there is a risk in the <laughs> simple story. Um, I, what is also uh, very uh, interesting with all the speakers we have today is that the diversity of formats that everyone is working on. And um, you mentioned impact, one of the issues, and I would like to come back to uh, Pulomi on her project, uh, Blo um, uh, Blood Speaks, and on this question of impact. I mean, the, the project in its scope and its scale is, is really impressive. You, you work uh, several years, and uh, um, it, it has expanded in, in multiple narrative, multiple format, uh, addressing uh, also diverse audience. And you mentioned some, some elements which I find very important. You make this work f for the community and coming back to the community. So I, I'm curious to know more about this aspect. And in other interview, you also emphasize the importance for you of having an impact with your work. Could, could you tell us something about this? We can't hear you yet. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, for my practice is quite broad, so uh, it works across social, political and uh, environmental intersectional issues as well, like Clarice. Um, but impact for me is kind of important because but I, I know that alone I can't do it. So what I do is like every time I work on a project, I tend to form coalitions with people. So I work with grassroots communities. I work with uh, activists who are working in the grassroots. I work with, um, I make fundraising campaigns where possible with charities. I, uh, so I form coalitions uh, and use sort of uh, multiple uh, sort of uh, principles and uh, sorry, multiple uh, players within the field. And together with my work, we, I try to sort of, um, you know, shake things up <laughs> uh, and, 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 and bring work to a diverse multiple audience. So my, I kind of operate between photography, art, and the film world. So, um, uh, I mean, my my next VR was just invited to the Venice Biennale Cinema for the production bridge, and so uh, I I occupy a space that is quite big. So. Uh, in a way, I feel like the more audience you can bring into your work, the greater the awareness and the impact is going to be. And if you continue to work in one space of photography, it's very hard to make any kind of impact because it's a really small niche audience. So I'm not interested in that so much. For me, it's really important that the more people get to see my work, the uh, the greater the value for the work will be and the more sort of uh, the greater uh, and the more coalitions you form, and with other resourceful uh, people, the more it is possible to impact, uh, bring impact, you know, and then how you take it back to the community and how you sort of create, make, use art as a social practice, you know, how you involve people who are directly your sitters or 
you know, people who are directly engaging with your practice. So it's not true for every single project I do, but the speaks particularly is a transmedia activism project. And um, it started with very simple photography and then it moved across to campaigns and, um, you know, guerrilla poster campaigns to like big campaigns that has raised, as I said, two million pounds before uh, to uh, VR uh, live action documentary to now into animation, you know, so uh, fiction. So, I mean, um, and all of this brings a range of different types of audience and people. So it's very, uh, and I do this for a lot of my other projects. Centralia, which is a book, is now a short 15 minute film and is going to become a feature film as well. So, um, and it's going to be a science fiction thriller. So it's, uh, it's again, it's sort of using different genres and I, I use kind of different genres and I bend, uh, I, will, I, I use journalism as a research tool, but I'm not really a journalist, but at the same time, because I, like Clarice, I work with uh, sort of multiple layers of truth and how, you know, the collision of those uh, different versions of truth gives you an idea of what is really going on in places. But again, to see how we can do some sort of groundswell and attach that artistic work with, um, uh, at uh, and uh, as a, some form of social practice when you're dealing with and it is directly in, uh, has some sort of political impact. So yeah, in a way, my work is extreme. It's very political, and um, yeah. <laughs> And um, to, to bridge to, to, to also to Clary's work, uh, I brought today your absolutely fantastic book, uh, Centralia. Would, would you like to, to say a few words about it or would you f rather focus on Blood Speak for now? Or Yeah, so uh, Centralia is a 10-year body of work um, which uh, sits at the nexus of ecofeminism, environmental justice and climate change. And uh, it uh, narrates, uh, it's basically uh, tells you uh, the story. It uses both facts and fiction to uh, tell you the complex story of this indigenous community in India, deep in the forest, where they are fighting a civil war against the government. And they have taken up arms to protect their land and their environment. And most of the people who are at the front line of this war are women, guerrillas, uh, who the government call terrorists. And so the book is really about, uh, um, it's more like, an, uh, it's in a way, it's a bit like a, a, a book of war crimes and uh, an investigative book, but at the same time, a, a hallucinatory sort of tale of what is really going on in this place and what means what, what does it mean and why has humanity reached the way it has today and how this sort of conflicts and uh, play, uh, con conflicts with indigenous communities have larger in the global, what it means in the global world where we have seen this sort of thing happen in, in America in the westward expansion. We've seen it in Colombia, it's in Philippines. So this is, um, and, and how our planet and how, how ecocides and genocides are often related with ecocides and how it's impacting the planet and to what level and where we are heading. And what the, it's a cautionary tale of where we are heading um, in the future. But it uses ecofeminism at the center of it, where women are basically at the front line of this violence and women of color. So it's kind of important for me to say that environmental justice and climate change issues are related directly and impact women and especially women of color as coming back to that intersectional uh, way of telling stories as well. Yeah. And it's a, it's a multi-layered narrative. It uses archival material, photographs taken in different cameras, um, mostly film over a long period of time and uh, puts it together. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you said uh, uh, in regard to this project, something um, you said, Truth is the first casualty of war. And I want to connect this to, to your work because I think the question of truth is central to your film and to your book. Uh, would you like to elaborate on this? Yeah, uh, yeah sure. That is uh, spot on, actually. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Pulumi. <laughs> um, I think also growing up here, for me, I had also had this very sort of um, um, binary idea of truth and um, right and wrong. 
and um, because um, uh, for you know my documentary, my book, what, what happened was I remember going back to Liberia and my dad, I was like 10, and he brought me to you know the president's house and I was like, oh, that's so cool, we're going to the president's house. I didn't even know who Charles Taylor was. And then I met him and he was super nice, he gave me cookies, I was like, okay, this is cool. And then um, as I grew older, I was like, wait a minute, this is kind of odd. And so I just sort of decided to, you know, uh, as I sort of studied journalism and, you know, got more uh, into organizing and political debates, um, that was something that always was at the back of my mind. And then I... Oh, sorry? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> um, and, um, and then I decided to sort of research it. And, um, and then as I did that, and when I went back also to film my dad and to sort of look up the story also about the founding of Liberia and what, how, how that went, uh, you know, how that, had it, had it, how that came about. And um, it's much more complex and, and nuanced. And um, truth, when in sort of conflict and in and, and, and war situations, is it's never sort of, um, it's alti always um, multilateral. It's always multi-layered. It's never uh, straightforward or one-dimensional. What is true for one person can be the exact opposite for another, which doesn't mean that there aren't things um, like facts, I think that's very important to say that facts exist um, also now, but um, that the way everyone interprets them or experiences them is different and, and particularly in a situation that is so sort of out of the normal context of a regular human life. Um, it's almost indiscernible to say this is what is true and this is not and um, for example, so my dad um, wasn't like a, um, a military person or whatever. He just worked within an office and he um, did this job for his whole, whole life, you know. He was um, um, someone that worked with uh, technology and communication and that was sort of his calling for, for the country to sort of develop the country in that aspect, which meant that he ha also had to work with people that he didn't necessarily agree with, um, which felt kind of felt like a sort of a, um, weird juxtaposition for me. Um, to me, and then, um, yeah, like I said, so researching it more, I, I, I realized that it's also a very it, uh, um, modern day, I guess, Westernite concept that there is, that there is such such a thing as sort of um, um, binary truth or, or 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 right and wrong, and I think also a lot of the things that we do or that we don't accept about ourselves come from that concept that because you do something that might come out wrong, that means you're a bad person. So then you do not acknowledge the thing you do because you don't want to be a bad person. Whilst you can say, you know, you can be a good person and do bad things and you can do a bad person and do good things. These, you know, these, we are complex as human beings. And when we don't acknowledge our complexity, we're not being um, truthful, but we can also not move forward. Um, and then context also always matters. So um, yeah, I think, yeah, like I said, that it's a very uh, spot on thing to say and I, and, um, and I think it, it, it doesn't even ha only happen to in African countries or the global south. I think looking at the U.S. Uh, presidency of the past years, that you know, you also had people that might have worked for a government that they didn't necessarily agree with, but that um, you just become part of a sort of system that, and, and then it's important to think about, okay, so do I want to be a part of this system? What is my what is my my um, function? And and I think. Oftentimes, like I said, people don't think about it as because when I talked to my dad, it wasn't something that he necessarily contemplated. I think maybe it's also that I I have the luxury to do that from my position, but that he didn't really have that, or maybe he didn't want to. Also, I think. Um, so yeah, but I, I I do think that moving forward and sort of transforming, you know, the way we um, do things in society, that it's important to acknowledge that multi uh, layeredness and. Um, and I also like what Pulumi said about sort of, um, yeah, the, 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 the uh, uh, future aspects. Um, I'm also working on a documentary right now, um, sort of starting from the Black Lives Matter um, up, uprising or, 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 I mean, you know, from last year and um, looking at it from a Dutch sort of a colonial context and, um, but using the concept of, of time um, and, and um, because in a lot of um, indigenous communities, time is, um, is, is, a, is a concept and it's not, you know, straightforward, it's not chronological. And actually also thinking about what does it mean to be in this moment that we're in now? Um, um, and you can only do that by acknowledging the moments that 
you know, came before and um, intertwining those. So past, present and future are all intertwined together. And once you have sort of um, um, yeah, researched that or, or narrowed that down, it's, you create a new way to sort of shape the future. And that's something that always comes back in my work. We have to sort of go back and remember and, and, and then, you know, move forward. <laughs> Thank you. I hope that was clear. <laughs> yeah. did, did, what, what kind of truth do you think you found then for um, yourself? For myself? Yeah, when, doing the doing book, this? the film, and the... Um, various truths, I, th I think. Um, the truth of, uh, of, yeah, the complexity of humanity, of being human, that, you're, mm -hmm. that uh, um, you, your, your parents are human, that you are human, that um, you might uh, love something or someone and not agree with what, what they do, what they have done, and um, uh, yeah, just the, the complexity of, of life, mm -hmm. and that it keeps evolving continuously. So. Mm -hmm. You know, one day, um, like for example, there were moments that I was like really mad at my father and there were moments that I thought, no, this isn't, you know, so you always go through these phases, I think. And I think that is what life is about, these phases in the process and mm -hmm. that they are fluid. Mm -hmm. And I think when we stay stuck and there's this rigidity, that's when we stop growing. So, yeah, that was a realization for me. Thank you. Yeah. And um, you, you mentioned time and Black Lives Matters, and uh, I want to go back to some of the project of uh, uh, Valentin uh, in the Lagos Biennale. I think the topic was time, mm -hmm. and you're now working on deep time. I think time is also very central to what you're researching and how you are articulating all the projects you are making. Um. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the theme of Lagos for so in 2018, which uh, I co-curated with three other women, um, was Time Has Gone, which was a, um, a theme that wasn't chosen by us, but it was chosen by the director of the foundation um, who leads the Lagos Photo Festival. So it was not our choice. Um, so maybe that's a bit different, but I think there was a sense at that time that there was an urgency to do uh, something. And so time has gone is an expression, like a colloquial expression that is used um, very often in Nigeria. That's why the director who is Nigerian chose it. Um, and it's, a, it's an expression when people use to, to say, like, quick, you have to hurry because time has gone. Um, it's sort of a prompt to action. Um, and what was interesting is that, I mean, I feel like this story I must have um, have told uh, to you before, Delphine. But um, actually, what happened is that I was doing a residency, um, a curatorial residency, and the director of the foundation, who is um, a man, uh, came to me and he said, "Oh, I'm thinking about the new theme, the theme for the 2018 uh, Lagos Photo Festival," and. Uh, considering all that's been going on with me too, I think it should be a, an edition devoted to women or something. And I exploded in laughter and I said, and you think it's fine for you to curate it? It's not something that you're thinking about as maybe it would be good to invite other people. And he's a good friend and we laughed about it and he was like, maybe you're right and maybe you should do it. And I was like, well, I don't think I should do it because it's a question of context as well. And I don't think I can. One, I don't think it's interesting as a theme, just like curate projects about women done by women. But I also think like, I can't be the representative of all women. I don't think that's meaningful in this moment. So we eventually agreed that there would be a theme he, which he chose. And then I would work with three other women. Uh, two of them were based in Nigeria, one in Senegal, and that was the fourth. Um, so I don't know, I mean, I feel like, uh, some of these questions of time, it's, it's just a matter of being in our reality. I mean, I think um, Clary said it very well, like the past, the present and the future are really embedded and you can't really isolate yourself from what happened in the past, but you also cannot not speak about the moment you're in. I was chatting yesterday with a curator who was telling me that one of the 
contributors to a book he was working on um, was very problematic because all of the interpretation of a contemporary artist that this writer was making was based on like uh, 18th century photography. And it felt like, you know, there was no tie with the, the current reality. So I, I don't think that, you know, I think, um, and Ryan, I'm sure, knows that also very well, but like even working with artists that are deceased, which we do all the time, you you have to kind of like consider how the work is perceived in the current moment. Otherwise, you completely miss the point. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm responding to your question, but but I guess that was my take. Yes, um, I, I, I want to also uh, come back to some things that is very common to all your work, which is that um, I'm going to use a quote of uh, Sarah Ahmed. She said, yeah, the personal is political, but the personal is also institutional. And um, there is, uh, in an interview in Liberation, uh, Valentin, you also made a personal uh, reference to your family history in relation to photography and images, which I thought was very beautiful and, and, and moving. Um, and uh, about the, the, yeah, the relation to time, but the appearance and disappearance of images. Um, do, do you remember? Shall, shall, shall I translate it from Liberation? Would you like to say a few words about it? Or uh, because I, I see, I like mean, I remember the context. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of works here are triggered by your family history. Uh, for uh, Pulomi, also uh, many of the work are. Uh, uh, the starting point is on the you know embodied experience, and and I would like, to, yeah, to. Um, um, Ask you the same question. So, um, you, you you made a reference to the fact that uh, you had only one on on the paternal, paternal side of your family. You had only one image left, uh, and and that there was a kind of attempt to to want to hold on to images uh, because of that uh, story. Um, yeah. To to be specific. Um my on my dad's side um so which is why i have my name which means literally i come from, from uman which is a city in ukraine um so I, it's very easy to trace the people from my family and lineage because our name literally says where we come from um all of the people died in camps um and my great grandmother um, I have very few images of because it was a deliberate uh, decision by Nazis to um, kill and erase all traces of um, her and people like her, which is very common. I mean, many people have a history of genocide in their family history, and indeed that connects several people. Um, but yes, I, I think I still think to this day that the, that's part of why I got really. And I would say obsessed with images and memory, and it's a it's a almost like a problematic thing in my life where I'm constantly like thinking I'm not remembering enough, and I need to keep track track and traces and um, so yeah, I think that's still valid. I don't know if you wanted to talk about family, but just one point though. Uh, yes, the personal is political, but also institutional, um, because realistically, as soon as there is society, there are institutions. So anything that is political is related to institutions because institutions um, are collated with society in my, in my view. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing this uh, with us. And uh, I, I would like to, I mean, to make it a conversation if you have uh, also a question to each other or... Uh, um, Listening, I was like, this is just everything um, that they're saying is so riveting. So, the, and there's so much that comes up. Um, but I was also wondering if the audience would maybe want to. We'll, we'll, or we're we'll going. Go, oh, we're going to the audience. To the Q and in in about ten minutes. So now it's more among the panel. Otherwise, I can uh, uh, continue to 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 ask some some questions. Uh, uh, I, I will about this idea of, of memory and preservation and who has uh, authority on images uh, on deciding what do we keep, that, what do we preserve, what's the national narrative. Uh, you, you have been 
when we were preparing this uh, um, conversation today, you were saying that you were uh, this year not so much curating, but uh, focusing in the museum more on policy and new policy of, among others, collecting. Um, is it something that you have uh, the possibility uh, to talk about with us or to share some? Or is it too soon? Or uh... um, well, it's <laughs> not that I'm really focusing on the on the collection right now. Yeah. It's just that that in uh, as a museum now we are in a moment of transition because a lot of people have uh, yeah changed jobs. So mm. it's a it's a moment of opportunity to really rethink the the, the museum in a way. And um, but I think something that comes to mind is is um, yeah thinking about how to deal with, with, with memory and, and who can deal with this memory and who has the authority or who can, can give the right voice to look at certain images or certain archives. Um, I think one very important project for us that's coming up is, is um, we have Sandrine Collard, who is a researcher, a doctor, doctoral um, researcher. Um, she's finished her, her, her uh, PhD already um, on on Belgian Congo and, and the photography in Belgian Congo during the colonial era. Um, this is a very, an extremely important research and she basically came to us and we, we found her, so we found each other um, uh, in a collaboration, which was for me like a, a gift from, from heaven because I've been hoping uh, for this kind of research to, to, to happen. I know that I knew of always knew that I was not in the position to, to do this research. I, I, I didn't have the research. I, I'm not in the Congolese com community in the diaspora, so I'm, yeah, I'm not in the position to do this as an institutional curator. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for someone who did this research and she came. Um, she came to us. She was very enthusiastic to work together um, with us to, on this project. So we're program, programming this next year. For us, this is a, a crucial exhibition. It's, it's in Belgium a very problematic issue. We, we are not dealing with our colonial history um, almost at all, I mean, <laughs> uh, as far as I'm concerned. So I think this is where institutions have to step up and have to take a stand and, and, and make a point uh, by, by making this research and, and all these insights um, available. So it's going to be a big challenge because um, it's, it's, it's all um, historical material. We have to find a way to make it accessible for a, a broad audience. Um, I hope that as many people uh, as possible <laughs> will, will come and join the debate. Um, yeah. And is it a process that you're opening up also with other museums? Uh, or is it something you initiated and, and can, that could be a template for other museums? Or how do you see that? Well, that's a good point. We, we're trying to, to get this exhibition travel also. Um, we've talked to quite some colleagues in, in the European uh, institutions. It's not so easy to, um, to convince people that it's not a local story. <laughs> Are we surprised? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, if anybody has ideas or is interested, then um, we are very, very open to work together. Um, this is, yeah, by all means, a project that has to to be developed with as many people as possible and as many voices as possible. So, mm -hmm. I would love to, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not an easy, uh, an easy quest, yeah. yeah. Mm. And uh, that's, that's some, some, for instance, also the heart of the, this, this polyvocality or this idea mm -hmm. that we have to speak from, from multiple perspectives that's, that's central to the book uh, Centralia, for instance, where, where, but which is also treated through uh, the materiality of, of, of the book. And, and I think there is really an urgency to, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to, to, to bring as many voices uh, on the table or to just build other tables, uh, you know, simply, but um, is, um, is, uh, I want to ask also uh, uh, Valentin a few, few words also about your work in Cincinnati. Um, mm, yes, you mean like, <laughs> Uh, uh, what I did generally there, or what yeah, it meant or, to be there. Yeah. Or also, I was interested in the, in the current uh, circumstances, or or what we uh, some of the issue that we address of this idea of confinement oh, yeah. that you develop this project, which I think is also relevant to this conversation of of uh, uh, exile sure. uh, and. <laughs> 
there are there are a lot of things that really relate to this topic um, about institutional violence um, about my time in Cincinnati that I'm not at liberty to convey in public. I think everybody will understand what that means. Um, so what I can say, <laughs> though, is that I chose to be for, for a while in Cincinnati for um, a lot of reasons, one of them being that I think it matters where we operate from. And I felt often that in Cincinnati, which is in the Midwest and in a place that is not considered central, I felt like the shows that I was able to curate or co-curate or work on uh, um, had more Im effect. I don't really love the term impact, which I find quite violent, but more effects, like it touched, it affected people more. Part of it being because a lot of people don't have access to contemporary art there, and it's their sole point of contact with contemporary art other than the internet. So they're, they're only kind of like uh, engagement. People would drive hours to just come to the museum because they're in Ohio and there is nothing else that is closer to their home. So I felt like this positioning was a deliberate choice, which I've since and before I, I had always made to be in places that are uh, not considered on the map. And I think what we do in those places really matters. And eventually for a bizarre reason related to Trump's politics, I got uh, stuck in Europe over the pandemic and was unable to return to Cincinnati. Um, so, so yeah, I guess that's kind of one question, but I'm not sure if that's what you were asking about. No, I was ask, asking about the show uh, confinement that you made and the screening. If you want to talk about it, I mean, I don't know. I have another question. Yeah, yeah go mean, ahead. the show yeah. is, um, it, I think, it, yes, it was called confinement. It was way before the pandemic. It was just because I think this question had always been on my mind and it was also reflecting on what, what kinds of bodies are confined and in what ways and have historically been confined. Um, it took on a completely different context. Obviously, the term changed meaning and we can't use it in the same way that I used it at the time. So I think maybe it's one of these things where if I looked at the term now, I would not be able to curate the same show, but it was... Um, it was quite a meaningful one to do at that time. And I was trying to also consider um, the context of where I was in Cincinnati, what kind of confinement exists there, uh, because historically it's a city that has been on the Underground Railroad. Um, so it effectively lies at the border between um, Northern and Southern states. And it's, um, it's a city where when you fly in, you actually fly into Cincinnati, to Cincinnati's airport, which is in Kentucky, not in Ohio. So that tells you how the city is like, actually the river divides like the Northern part, which is in Ohio and the Southern part, which is in Kentucky. It's, it's very telling of how the history like um, sort of crystallized in there. So operating from an institution that is there, it also means like being aware of where the money comes from still to this day when you're doing shows and when you're interacting with people that have been there for like hundreds of years, you kind of have to know why they're collecting and where their, their money came from. And a lot of that money was coming from like Southern states. So I think those questions had to be posed and maybe the topic of confinement was a way to ask that at the time. Thank you. Clarissa, the question, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I guess I thought we were moving on to the audience, but I can yeah, ask. Yeah, we're going to move on. Yeah, Let's I don't want to take up their time. We've already been talking for so long. Maybe I'll ask when they're done. <laughs> Let's go to the audience first. It's okay. So, thank you. Are there questions from the audience? Uh, is, there should be a mic circulating. Um, I have the light dazzling me, so you have to be vocal if you want to speak, <laughs> because I cannot see. Yeah, I have a mic. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so good evening, everyone, uh, and thanks a lot to the speakers that give really inspirational 
talks today and uh, thanks a lot of raising this uh, such an important issues about the providing impacts by your work um, because I, I, I do believe that art can can make a difference and can raise the awareness in the public about the important issues so um, and it's a powerful tool to open people's mind and to point their attention so my question will be um, so according to your experience of providing impact on people, uh, what will be your suggestion, your advice to uh, emerging talents, emerging artists that are watching you and hearing you right now in our studio and online, like how they can maximize the impact by their work, where they should start from? Thank you. It's for Pulumi? It's for Pulumi? For who? It's actually for uh, for all the speakers. So oh. if you can like <laughs> sum up like how they can maximize the the impact by their work, because you know they are just maybe at the beginning of their uh, of their path and they are still thinking like uh, how to promote their project. So this is really important for them to 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 get some advice from people who already experienced that. Um, I'll, can I? I'll take it first. So. Um, I think I speak from a post-colonial perspective where I've seen people historically come fly into parachute into my part of the world, you know, take photos and then show it in newspapers and everywhere, which has a very short life, you know, of the work and nothing really ever comes back to the community. So I've always felt like as an artist of South Asian, uh, as a South Asian artist, I've always felt that uh, it's important to sort of give something back to the community and let them give them some sort of agency in their own sort of storytelling, which is really important. And I think is the right way to sort of embark any kind of whether you actually want impact or not is another thing. But let people involved, give them agency to tell their own stories, which is really important because most people in the West think if you're a poor woman living in South Asia in the majority world, you probably lack agency to tell your own story, which is a complete myth. And because every person that I have met in my life from all walks of life and communities from Dalit to Adivasi, indigenous people to every all the women I've always felt they're very powerful, strong, and they want to tell it, tell their own stories, you know. So it's about making that space, you know. Again, it's about giving your, making that space, whether you're in an institution on a table or like, you know, where you're in the community, making that space for people and letting them, you know, be a part of your practice and engage them as well. I think that's, that's how you kind of start thinking about making impact. Because for me, empathy is not a destination, you know. It's like, I know Valentin said impact effect, both are important, but at the same time, is it just enough to provoke people? Is that your ultimate aim? Or do you want to give your audience an agency to know what to do next or where to go if they really want to make meaningful, you know, do something meaningful in their way where they don't just feel they've been empathized and moved by something so much that they don't know where to go and how to change something or do something or contribute towards something that, you know, bring some sort of positivity and let you go back home and sleep well, you know? So for me, I've al I always think about that, that is it enough to just provoke or is it, is empathy a destination or is it something more that we as artists are responsible for and we should be doing? A good place to start would be reinventing your practice and thinking how you can work with greater agency and how you can let people reclaim their narratives and tell their own story because it, it's not just in Blood Speaks, but it's also in Centralia where there are multiple narratives of people coming up and telling their own story in the book. And it, in any, in, in no less way, it makes me less of an author, you know, in any way, because I've had very, very famous photographers come up and tell me, but you're not the author of the book, you're giving away your authorship. But I've always felt like, why should I be the moral arbiter of sto the truth? You know, like, who am I? You know, I am, I can just give you my version of what I think, what I feel or how I feel. And maybe it's enough, maybe it's not, but it's also my responsibility when I'm, and I, when I'm coming into a place, which is not my own to sort of provide that uh, multi-layered perspective and in a way that it helps the audience to interrogate the, the stories and the work. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely uh, agree. I love that you said that. And also, this is something that I, I've also been thinking about because I think, you know, there are different ways to make an impact or whatever. Also, what does impact mean? You know, really depends on 
you know, who you are and what it is that you're doing and uh, what your goal is. But um, the question that I've been asking, you know, what is what, what is the goal? And is it just, I think often, you know, with, with uh, artists and creators, it's we're, we're making this thing and then we can ask for attention. And then what does that attention do? What, what we see now is like, yeah, OK, so people look at it and then they look away from it again. You know, there's this hype. A lot of things are becoming hyped and then everyone's mm -hmm. concerned and then um, nothing happens with it. And um, and on one side, I think it's not sort of every individual's responsibility to always make things happen. But I think it is a good question to think about. Um, and for me, for example, uh, I think a, a, a paradigm shifts are important. So sort of changing the collective, um, um, yeah, the collective uh, uh, structures of things that we have uh, been taught to think as as normal or this is the way it is and and moving towards you know sort of a, 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 a liberated society and I think a lot of so um, awareness comes with that but there's also a, a part where um, for me creation comes in and when it's not just about thinking about these things but also doing them so what does it mean to 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 create or to um, 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 move with intention and action to sort of create the things that we that, that we that we do want. And I think um, sometimes these <coughs> themes, all of these themes and these topics become sort of very um, um, big and scary when it's not just about what is happening across the ocean, but also what is happening next door to you, what is happening in your backyard, what is happening with your neighbors, what is happening in your in your neighborhood, and um, sometimes your your you your um, your presence is more needed there than you know than across the ocean. So um, and I think also that's more tangible because then you you can do more, um, you can show more because you know more about your own environment and um, it's just closer to you and it's, uh, and it's smaller. And I think uh, sometimes we think we have to do these uh, grand gestures or, um, but I, I think, I don't know who said that, but you know, when it's about um, uh, changing things or awareness or having uh, effect or impact or whatever, it's often uh, tiny little things that become larger things and just see yourself as a part of the, the, the sort of bigger narrative and um, do what it is that is within your power. So I think my advice would be look for what is within your power to do and then go and do that. And yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to add, I think it's really nice that you both um, emphasize that it's really important to have impact on on the story that you're telling, on, on the people you're talking about, and, and these, I mean, really the subject, um, it's nev it can never be about impacting, impact on as many people as possible, as, as reaching out um, a, the, the widest audience as possible. I think it's what an artwork really should do is be responsible towards itself, towards its right. its content. Right. And, and I think that's the only way to, I mean, and then impact into a larger audience is is collateral. It's, it, yeah. Not it's, damage, but, but, but it's yeah. a part of it. It's yeah. like a and it, happy coincidence. It's a happy coincidence. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think the, the more you relate to your content, the better the work will, will become and yeah. the stronger it will be. And thus, the impact will be bigger. But impact can never be a goal in itself. In itself. No. That's that's something that I'm, yeah, rather convinced of. Yeah, not if it's not connected to sort of yeah. a very intrinsic, yeah, that's you it. know, drive or mm. a motivation or thought or yeah. So, and I think to be able to do that, you have to th think a lot and, and do a lot of be very introspective about mm -hmm. uh, what it is that you're doing and and, exactly. and why. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I love that you both bring it back to the, the communities and the, yeah. the content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and um, um, I also think I recently spoke with someone, you know, this very famous Dutch artist who was like, who goes even beyond, who is like a lot of things that he does. He makes sure, for example, that there's a sort of um, reparation aspects to it when, because he works a lot in foreign countries and that um, so that the people that he uh, works with or showcase that they get paid as much as other people here would get paid yep. and that they maybe can i don't know buy their purchase their land back or whatever so that's something that i think not everyone is capable of doing i know i'm not capable of doing that yet but i mean you can think about okay so what is it what is it that i can do that can sort of give people back their agency or play a part in that mm -hmm. or um yeah 
and that's an ongoing conversation with yourself and the industry that you work in. Thank you. Are there, are there more questions from the audience? Can there's a microphone. Um, hi. I have a question for Polumi, or maybe for all of you, might be relevant. But I'm thinking about um, the specific personal artist working with big institutions like NGOs being an example. And that relationship, and if you, Pulumi, or maybe if someone else have, exa have, have examples of when um, there's a negotiation, because I guess the, the NGO or the institution have an agenda or have uh, policies, and maybe that doesn't always rhyme with the artistic intention. Yeah, that was actually my question, so thank you. I, I figured this question would come, so thank you for <laughs> asking it. <laughs> You're on mute, I think, yeah. again. You're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. So the thing is that I only work with uh, ch uh, people uh, who give me complete creative control, uh, uh, where I am allowed to make my own interpretation of the work and do it my, with my own vision and creativity. And then you know, it's you then how we use the work to raise funds or raise money to bring it back to the community and to sort of help with infrastructural facilities in the community. So I have never worked with an NGO. I mean, unless it's an assignment back in the days when I was starting out, like an NGO would give you an assignment to photograph some fisherman's community or something, which, had, you know, it's an assignment. It's, it's I, I mean, back in the days, you know, you do it to make money and you treat it like a corporate assignment, it's a corporate job, there's nothing, you know, but if you're making your personal work and you want to form those coalitions with uh, other uh, players to sort of create some sort of, uh, you know, do some campaign, you know, then, um, I, I would only work with people, I have only ever worked with people on that where I have complete artistic and creative control because, um, yes, I mean, and it is so far, I, I because I work with such few, I, won't, I mean, I really select people I, like Water Aid and I have had a relationship since 2013, 12, in fact. So it's a long relationship. So they know who I am and they know what my practice is about. So, uh, you know, I mean, and there are very few people, I mean, they've worked with Ida Mulune, they've given her like a very creative assignment to um, represent what water crisis means in life. You know, I've, I've worked with them. Uh, they, they worked with another friend of mine called Mustafa Abdulaziz, who, whose personal work is all about water. And then they brought him on to then do expand on what is already existing in his works. So there are lots of good charities where they allow artists to bring on with their own creative vision and use, you know, it's a collaboration between them then to see how they can use the work for some sort of meaningful, you know, impact and campaign, you know. But um, I, I, I mean, I, but I'm utterly aware how NGOs can have vested interests and control and dictate, you know, that kind of work looks very different. You know, if you make something for an NGO, that will look very different from what you want to do as an artist yourself, because that is your vision. It's your, uh, it's how you see and what you want to tell. So there are very few, if you're lucky to align yourself with those, uh, uh, those NGOs, then it's a, it's a, it's a great marriage, but it, I, I suppose in many other cases, it's not like that. Yeah, so be careful to choose who you want to form coalitions with. Yeah, it makes me think it, about um, this uh, um, article, this um, essay uh, by Arundhati Roy on uh, the injurization of society. <laughs> it's an amazing article. Um, uh, uh, or some, something like that. But then she talks about how, you know, NGOs have become these sort of almost corporate entities themselves, you know? and. Um, um, the, the trouble with that, but um, not to say that there aren't NGOs that, of course, um, uh, are doing great work and it's also uh, great to work with, but just about this whole systemic thing. And I think um, 
uh, this is a question that I also deal deal with or struggle with. I wouldn't or I wouldn't say struggle, but that I ask myself often. And I think in an imperfect world with imperfect systems, you're going to have to engage with them, or else you'll do nothing. You know, you and then of course that's an option. You can do nothing, and that's also fine. But uh, if you want to do something, sometimes you will have to engage with imperfect um, companies. And 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 and, and um, then I think the question is. Uh, what is a what is your goal? What is a value to you? And that's only something that you can you can tell you can say. You know, I think another person cannot define that for you. But that you have to think about. Okay, what is it that I want to do? And is it possible to do that within this collaboration or with this company? And or, or and can I live with you know whatever harm it is that they're causing? Can I live with that? Is that something that's just a part of you know the world, or is it something that they're very active in doing? And I, mm -hmm. that's at, at least that's the question that I ask myself. And and that's a perfect ending because yeah. <laughs> Marina is showing me a sign that oh, we have okay, to, we have end. to end. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, unfortunately, um, but that's a opening, uh, finishing with this great question is. Yeah, it's. I think know your own boundaries and then you know try to uh, follow yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to add and make it very clear that. NGOs are corporate institutions, so please don't ever think that they are some artistic institution. They're not. But how, what your goal is and what kind of coalitions you want to form in then and how you can use it to a better end is how you can decide and dictate depending on your relationship and your power as an artist, you know. So, you know, control your own thoughts, your power and use it to achieve what you really want to achieve. So we have to finish. Uh, thank you very much for being here today uh, in real life or online. And thank you very much for Clarice, Rhein and Pulomi and Valentin for joining us today. Thank you. A big applause thank for all you. of you. Thank you. Thank to our guests, to our speakers and moderator. Thank you, Clarice, Rhein. Polumi and Valentin and Delphine for moderating for this really important conversation. It was great to have you today. We are finished with our afternoon program and we'll have a longer break of one hour and a half. And then I'm inviting you to, to join us for an artist talk and performance of Moreshin Alayari, which starts at 7.30 p.m. sharp here live from Melchweg, Amsterdam. Thank you.